CATV's series, Waterloo Gardens. Waterloo Gardens is a show created by people who love gardening for people who are interested in gardening. The show will consist of several brave gardeners who have volunteered <laughs> to let the public into the process of gardening. So we will have episodes throughout the growing season showing our different gardens and what we're doing in them. This first episode is to introduce you guys to who we are and what our gardens are like. We all have different tastes in gardening and different things that we enjoy doing. So we have a nice variety of gardens to share with you. Um, I'm going to go first in introducing myself. My name is Laura Cotting. I live on the corner of Harrison and Knowlton Street. I have had a lifelong interest in gardening, which I inherited from my parents. My father loved growing vegetables, and my mother loved growing flowers. My husband and I bought our property in 2006, and mom and I started the first garden that very spring. We planted tulips and blood roots. Um, I could best describe my garden, or my yard, as a floral smorgasbord, or a Whitman's sampler. I like experimenting with different plants. I like variety. And I like to always have something blooming. And there is always something blooming in my yard, starting with the reticulated iris in February, going all the way through the dahlias, the mums, and the fall blooming crocuses in October. And I just wanted to share with you that this morning, I went outside and saw a fall blooming crocus blooming. <laughs> and you will see a picture of that. And this is in the middle of January, so. What can I say? <laughs> you know, the other thing about my gardens is that I enjoy growing perennial plants mostly, and I also grow vegetables and kitchen herbs. So, who wants to introduce themselves next? I'll go next. All right. I'm Lisa Herchert, and I live in the last block of Jackson Street, um, towards Knowlton. And um, we've lived there for just a little bit over 20 years. I grew, I've, I've always had gardening in my life. My, I remember my grandfather's vegetable garden and my grandma's roses. I, my parents had gardens. I, my mom gave me my, my own little plot when I was a kid. And everywhere I've ever lived, I've had a garden, even if it was a balcony um, in an apartment. So when we got our house, um, it started out small and then, you know, every year grew and pretty much now has taken over most of the yard. I like to grow my own annuals and vegetables. I have a portable greenhouse that I put up every year. And I, I like to grow unusual varieties too. I like to have a lot of um, things, everything blooming, something always blooming like Laura. And, um, I grow also vegetables. Because I have somewhat of a small garden, it's always um, what I can fit in where. So vegetables and flowers are mixed, and I'd have to describe it as more of a cottage garden style is sort of what I'm after. So that's me. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Annette Novak. I've lived in Waterloo about 20 years now. Um, Oh, and I live on Monroe Street, practically downtown, across the street from the police station, probably is yes. the best way. Um, and I didn't discover gardening till I was in probably my mid-20s. I pursued art and business, and then I had a job, and I wanted to do something different, and so I took some part-time jobs, and I ended up working for this amazing woman on the weekends. She had eight acres of gardens and she just spurred something. I just got the bug, went back to school, got my degree in landscape architecture and my my own personal garden is is just playland for me. 
And it's more than a hobby because it's also what I do for a living. So I'm lucky in that regard. So, yeah. <laughs> My name is Jeffrey Stewart Otteson. People know me as Otto. I just want to see that movie, Otto, if you ever get a chance to see that movie. It's a wonderful movie. But I grew up on a farm, 166 acres, and we rented 80 acres more over in Cottage Grove, Deerfield area. And uh, we had 80, or 44 milking cows, and we had pigs, we had chickens, and of course we had a garden. And we had sweet corn, we had potatoes with the main focus of the garden, along with vegetables and stuff like that. So we uh, had 20 acres of tobacco, which people don't realize that we grew in a grow around here. And some people that are watching this, I'm sure, went out and helped me uh, harvest the tobacco. Back in, the, back in the day that I came here in 1975 and have been here and I taught at the high school and middle school and um, I got into gardening just because I uh, have always been in gardens but um, I have 30 raised beds at the house and um, I mainly do vegetables, fruit, I have apples, I have uh, strawberries, I have raspberries, I have, uh, I have a cut flower raised bed for my wife. She cuts the flowers and makes vases out of them. And then we also have uh, perennials and uh, hostas and, and uh, in her garden, yeah, part of the garden, so I can take care of her garden as well. Um, other than that, I've enjoyed it and I hope to continue gardening for many, many years yet. <laughs> gardening is a lot of work and it helps to be really interested in it because of all the work and it can also be expensive. Um, however, at least for me, it's worth it. The money, the time, the hard work is all worth it because of what I get out of it. And I wanted to share what I personally get out of gardening. The most biggest benefit I get from my garden is emotional health. It helps me cope with the stresses of life. And when I'm going through a very tough period in my life, I have my garden. It, it soothes me and it gives me hope, uplifts my spirit. And the reason why it does that, because <clears throat> I've thought about, well, wh why do I feel like this? Is that I feel like I'm participating in creation. I'm participating in the miracle of life and growth. And the plants are really doing all of the work. I just give them a place to do it in and do what I can to make their job easier. And then when I have the results, I feel a sense of joy, like I have helped make something beautiful. So that's the deep reason why I like gardening and that's the biggest benefit I get out of it. I get a couple of other things out of it too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm a very tactile person, and I love the way the soil feels. So I don't garden with gloves. I like the feel of the soil, and I like the scents of the soil and the hummus. And the final thing I get out of gardening is that there's nothing that beats fresh, organic produce straight from your garden. Mm -hmm. Nothing beats it. So what do you get out of your gardening? Well. Um... The produce is great as well. I, I don't ever eat tomatoes unless it's in the summer, first of all. It's got to be from a farmer's market or from my garden. So preferably from my garden because tomatoes can get expensive. Um, also, I, I love making flower arrangements. So I, I have to think, when I think about my garden and what I like to grow, I really like to grow a lot of cut flowers. I do grow a mix of perennials and, and annuals, and, but um, I really love to have the, the cut flowers, and I make a lot of bouquets and, and give a lot of bouquets away, and I love to do that. I love to go out every day and deadhead and walk around. The other thing that I get out of my garden is the opportunity to help pollinators, and I've really been big into many years now um, growing several different types of milkweed, um, t for monarchs, I've been part of the tagging program for monarchwatch.org, and I'm now um, a monarch way station. So, uh, because I met the qualifications, and so I get a lot of joy out of that. How 
how does how does that work? A monarch way station. Yeah, so you... That'll be a special episode. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you all about it. Yes. <laughs> to see the planet. Oh, no. And I, and I, <laughs> yes, and I do grow my, I, I grow the, the milkweed from my own seeds because oh. Oh. you can't usually find what I like to grow in, in a typical greenhouse. So <laughs> that's when I started my own seeds because I wanted to grow different things. I don't grow petunias. I like to grow things that aren't typically found. So, yeah. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, for first of all, just the beauty. You know, gardens are extraordinary, and um, a, you know, a flower like a peony, or um, you know, is there's so many colors and shapes and varieties now. Um, there's so many plants in so little time. And uh, it's just fun to, to do that. I, I do get a lot of emotional, um, you know, it's very, you know, you have a rough day, you just go start weeding in your own <laughs> garden and your troubles just kind of melt away. And there goes another problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. And sometimes I go out, um, like on the weekend, I'll just wander out in my robe, I'll pluck a few weeds, and before you know it, two hours have gone by. Mm -hmm. And my husband's like, where'd you go? <laughs> I just went outside. <laughs> so <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, I guess, you know, just, and also just, I love, I mentioned that it's what I do for a living, and um, I just love the physical aspect of gardening as well. You know, yeah. you're giving back to the environment, but you're also healthy yourself and I like coming home tired, mm -hmm. physically tired. So, yeah. Well, I've been working on farm, and I do love the work, and the garden gives me that type of work. And it, um, I'm also diabetic, okay? And normal people, have you ever heard of A1, A1C? Normal people are between four and six. And they always say on TV that they get your A1 down. Well, the garden helps me do that. And I also get to eat food fresh from the garden instead of the processed food in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the stores and stuff like that. My A1 is 5.3, which is very, very good for a diabetic who's been a diabetic for almost 50 years now. So, mm -hmm. it, uh, so that, it, that gives, me, gives me peace, you know, and it... Uh, like I said before, my wife loves flowers and we cut flowers and makes bouquets and give them away and things like that. And, but just working in the garden, getting the, the fruit and vegetables there, eating them fresh, mm -hmm. is just wonderful. It, um, and that's what gives me strength, is working in the garden. It, um, yeah. I just love every minute of it. <laughs> and I get tired, too. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, um, it's just like being on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get some surprise benefits from gardening. Uh, we did buy our house, as I said, in, in 2006, and uh, started small, and every time I found a neat-looking plant, I'd make a new bed to give that plant a home. But it was, it was an inward for me. You know, I'm doing this for these reasons, and I'm getting these benefits. A surprise benefit I got out of my yard and garden is that uh, since we're on a corner lot and get a lot of foot traffic and a lot of vehicle traffic, and that Walton Street is pretty much a major corridor, a lot of people go by my house, so I'm always in my yard, the people are going by, and I get into these cool, spontaneous conversations. <laughs> I have met so many people just pulling weeds in my own garden. And I've gotten so into so many interesting conversations over the years with these people, and I never know what we're going to talk about. Um, but I, I enjoy that. I, I call them my sidewalk friends. <laughs> I have sidewalk friends now. I'm one of those. <laughs> you are. You know, so is your husband. And, uh, you know, see Otto walking his dog, and uh, see your husband biking with his dog. It's, it's just so that's been an unexpected benefit. The other unexpected benefit that I have gotten from my garden is that 
it makes other people happy. It doesn't just make me happy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I discovered this because complete strangers would drive by in their cars, and they still do, and they honk or lean out their window and say something like, I love your flowers! <laughs> <laughs> and, and what makes me happy about that is, is I like making people happy. I want them to smile when they go by my house. I don't care if they know my name or talk to me or anything. It's just, I feel good when they feel good. So they feel good, I feel good, we both feel good, and the world is a little brighter. So two unexpected benefits. <laughs> what unexpected benefits have you gotten from your garden? Oh man, I, that's a tough one. I, I don't know if I, I was thinking while you were talking, I, I, I don't know, I don't think I have one. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> I think everything, I mean, just, yeah, I, nothing unexpected. I think I feel like I, everything that, now well, maybe you can come back to me. Okay, no worries. This is informal. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, We're all I just don't know. <laughs> Anybody else have a brainwave about that? I, um, well, besides the, um, the wildlife that might come in, yeah. you know, um, you probably, get, you obviously get lots of butterflies, but I, it's like a photo moment when I see a monarch. Mm. You know, I try to plant things that'll bring them in, yeah. but um, it's also catching them. You know, I'm not always, I'm gone a lot during mm -hmm. the day. So the, the social part is I also, you know, get a lot of people saying, you know, love your garden. And it, it's, it's a nice thing to hear, you know, that people, that I'm not just doing it for my own pleasure, mm -hmm. that other people are getting something out of it or ideas, you know. And the last thing that I thought of was, um, I have fabulous soil. I live in a really old house and it, there's no fill. So <laughs> it's, it almost can become a problem, even though I don't see it that way, but I have things that naturalize like crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of fun. I have blood root everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I've decided that that's okay. You know, it does its thing. You know, and then if I have too many leaves, I cut some back. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like the blue scylla that comes up. Some people freak out. Oh, no, it, you know, they're going to start strangling other stuff. It, it comes and it goes. You know, I've got other little stuff like that. Um, Pushkinia. Mm -hmm. I don't know all the common names, so um, kind of doxa. But they're, they're kind of like the blue scylla, just different colors that naturalize in your yard. And crocus. That was a big surprise, because usually the squirrels eat them all. But I have such a busy front yard, the squirrels don't come to my front yard. Oh boy, I wish I right. So I've been fortunate. Right. That, that yeah. was an unexpected yeah. thing. Yeah, the squirrels. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right. So you know what, I was thinking about that, and I, it, it is unexpected, and I think that you, um, it is getting to know my neighbors because if we didn't, if we weren't in the yard, if we weren't outside, then we really wouldn't be talking as much as we talk, and it, it's that has really helped us to get to know each other. And I think also sharing knowledge about what they're growing, what I'm growing, what their experiences are, and I can share experiences with them, and I can share abundance when I grow too much of something, which I always do and then I can give some away to someone else. So I think that's an unexpected benefit. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> with, the, with the McKay Way developing as fast and big as it has lately, I get a lot of walkers mm -hmm. that come around the block and, it, uh, and that's been a joy for me because the mothers and fathers will bring their children. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I see them in the front yard, we're going back to the garden, you know, and the kids can run around and pick blueberries and pick raspberries and eat them and strawberries and I mean it's just uh, and then they'll then they'll come back again too because they know that if if they come to my house and there's one color, one family they bring their dog with so my dog can run around with them too <laughs> get, getting both tired so it helps but uh, the kids come back and to try to try to develop that knowledge and 
inspiration for the kids to mm -hmm. garden when they get older. And it, uh, but that's been very, very fun to yeah. do, to have the kids come and mm -hmm. go back there. And it uh, yeah, brings me joy. <laughs> it, uh, we could talk about the monarch butterflies. If I could just put something in here. Sure. What are the What do you plant for monarch? Milkweed. Thank you. It, uh, <laughs> I'm over seventy, so I forget things. <laughs> but uh, if anybody is interested, when I had the farm, okay, we had garden out at the farm. But I also talked to the county, okay, and they would give you a thousand dollars an acre if you would plant that plant. So if anybody oh, out there great. is interested in the country, that's wonderful to hear. I mean, it uh, they will. It's like a crep land. Okay, mm. I had crep land out at the farm, and mm -hmm. but that's just an interesting point when you brought that because they're trying to develop the monarchs I to come didn't here. I know that. And it, um, if so anybody's wonderful. got big lands that they mm -hmm. could, they get paid well. I mean, it's a thousand dollars an acre just to plant oh. that, and leave it there, and but you got to leave it there for fifteen years. Oh. Uh, no problem. Well, there is a catch to it, but that's. Is it a thousand dollars an acre per year? Yes. And oh wow! Please share the contact information. Yeah. We don't have to. You don't have to do it right now, but at the end of this yeah. episode, we can roll it up on the screen yeah. so yeah. the viewers can see who to I'd, contact. I'd go up to the county, the county in Madison County Board, the area county, and to certify my crep land and stuff, and, and that's one of the programs they had available. So the other crep land out at the farm, I'd have flowers and you know a lot of flowers and stuff there, wildflowers and grasses and different grasses. But uh, that was an interesting, it, um, if anybody's interested in that. But it's uh, very, very lucrative, put it that way. Yeah. As long as it's open for the for the yes. butterflies. But uh, yeah. So one thing about gardens is that you're, <clears throat> you are doing something to your, your landscape, you're, you're altering it in some way. And that comes with challenges. And uh, when you're starting a garden in a new place, part of doing that is learning about what the big challenges are. So in our yard, we had two big challenges. One was shade. We, my husband and I love trees. We bought the property in part because it had 14 mature trees. So that meant a lot of shade. And it, what it also meant was what I call the war of the trees, where they're all mature, they're a little too close together. So looking in the canopy, I could see the different branches growing out this way and that way and, and just competing for sunlight. The war of the trees, and some of the trees would kind of be, you know, losing the war, and, and, and the trees that were winning would develop these very long, snaking branches that would then snap in the high wind, and it was just, that was not good. And the way I met the challenge of the shade, where there's two ways, you can either get plants that can deal with the challenging environmental circumstance, like shade-tolerant plants. Um, such as hostas and astilbes, but honestly, um, they're a little expensive. They, I found overall they're a lot more expensive than the, the sun-loving plants. Um, the other thing that you can do is find where on your property has the most sunlight. And what I discovered walking around the neighborhood is I, I saw this lady who has grown, had flower patches on her tree lawn. So I said to myself, my tree lawns are really sunny, so why don't I put some flower beds in there? I talked to the DPW and found out that yes, you can plant in your tree lawn as long as it, you're not planting trees or woody shrubs. And the other condition is that you have to accept the fact that if they do some work on your street, they can dig up your beds yeah. and you, you, you have to deal with it. That's a, a condition. So. So I'm aware of that and design my tree lawn beds accordingly because, and I keep track of the uh, city council agenda because <laughs> <laughs> I've got one road with a lot of potholes in it and sooner or later they're gonna get around to it. Um, and the plants are such that I could run out and dig them up and save them mm -hmm. in buckets and stuff. So, yeah. so that's the trade-off there. The other challenge that 
we have in our yard is uh, we have this lens, this dense, thick layer of clay. And it is super thick, super dense clay. And I have, have a little example that I brought, which <clears throat> when my youngest was four, he would garden with me and in our vegetable garden with this high clay layer to amuse himself while I was wrestling with the clay to put my plants in, <laughs> he'd make little clay shapes. So this is a 15-year-old sun-dried clay ball that he made. Pass it around here. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, they, they made little sculptures and stuff. Oh that, that's the kind of clay well. we had to deal with. And again, you meet an environmental challenge by either getting plants that can deal with it. Oh, so clay-tolerant flowers are uh, like a, yeah irises or lilies, or you can amend your soil. Um, so for a vegetable garden, we actually started buying dump truck loads of black cow organic compost. And every three years, the dump truck dumps it into our vegetable garden and, and we till it in. That's made a huge difference. It has really probably, like what Annette has naturally, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we, we buy it. Um, but that really has made for amazing vegetable crops and our garden is just our vegetable garden is eight feet by 20 feet and we we have to can we get so much produce out of it mm -hmm. and that's why so I'm sure the rest of you have environmental challenges in, in your yards that you've had to overcome for your gardens and mm -hmm. I know yeah. you've got some I similar do. ones <laughs> yeah um, I live in a really old house too but but, but my clay my, my soil is was really heavy clay um, especially close to the house. So um, I've been amending my soil with leaf mulch mainly. I, li I like to use leaf mulch, mm -hmm. and I think that's really made a big difference. And I add compost, and I, and I do compost myself. So just every year I just keep doing it. And this year, or the last couple years now, I've been reading about it and just um, Letting everything die back naturally instead of cleaning it out at the end of the season doesn't look so pretty right now, but that's also good for your soil. So I like that. Yeah. It's not having to turn everything over every year. Another really big uh, challenge I have is the shade. Um, a lot of shade. I've, my house is surrounded by very mature trees, very large maples and that's a constant challenge. I, I do grow things that are shade tolerant. Um, and some of the trees, my husband and I have just been pruning in our front yard and, and just, just trying to deal with it because what, what can you do? We have a small lot, big trees, and it's just something that we have to adapt to. Yeah. Uh, um, drainage is something I've had to deal with. Um, I don't have many downspouts on my house, big eaves. All the water falls into the gardens, which is good and bad. Um, so in a heavy rain, there might be points where a couple roofs come together and it's like a little waterfall. Mm -hmm. And it being an old house, the basement is boulders. So it the water will find a way. Mm -hmm. So we, we've pretty much fixed that issue everywhere. But one really creative, fix that I thought was, I've continued to have a lot of fun with it, is in the front of the house, there is a, a spot where like three roofs converge and it, in a really deluge, it's a trickle in the basement. Well, we, I bought this big trough and it's become this huge opportunity for me to do annuals and perennials and change it out for the seasons and it's slightly tipped so that the water falls on the back. We've engineered it. We've got some like um, insulation in it to help so it's not all soil, because it's a huge trough. And um, so the, the water falls in the back, the plants grow in the front, and then it makes its way to the corner, which we have these old rusty, I don't know what they are. They're, we got them at this old antique place. Um, that funnels the water. The rustier, the better, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And it funnels the water out away from the house into the kind of this low depressed rock gardenish thing that I created in the front. And it's working. So that, that was fun. Yeah. 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 And I, I put a few pictures 
much of it on the thing. Um, the public terrace is a challenge for me as well. Um, lots of walkers and lots of people with dogs that like to pee in the same spot. <laughs> I love dogs. I, I love them and I, I love people walking by. But you have to plant some pretty tough stuff to combat that um, because dog urine kills stuff. So I have, um, I reverted to natives. They can take it. And then also the, the in the winter, we live, Monroe Street's all way, also Highway 89, huge plows come down mm -hmm. and just piles of dirty, salty oh. stuff just comes flying into my public terrace and the native plants can take it. So that's a couple yeah. Uh, yeah. challenges I've dealt with. Good. Yeah. Good too. <coughs> yeah. So. Mm -hmm. We have we had some challenges with the trees. I had two maple sugar maples in the front of the yard when I first bought the house in '75, and they were the ground. You couldn't get a shovel into the ground mm. because they were root bound. Everything. Mm. My sewer, mm. my sewer was getting plugged up by roots, so I ended up cutting down the two uh, sugar maples in the front of my house, and there was 118 rings oh, in, the, wow. in the tree wow. when I cut it down. Cool. Uh, there's still a sugar maple on the side of the house, which you know doesn't bother anything, but uh, drainage is another problem, because I am sitting down uh, in the, the, the flood of 2008, Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was over my head. Yeah. The water around the garden and, and the, the boards and stuff I had in the garden were floating and going on to Nolten, Nolten Street. It, uh, it, was, it was bad. Yeah. It, uh, but, yeah, the trees, I have good, I have good, good sunlight, though. The tree, the tree that I have in the yard there, she, it doesn't, it doesn't bother my garden. The sun can get there and mm -hmm. do well, and the hostas and stuff that my wife plants in the, in the shade under that tree are doing very well. It, um, so, yeah, a few problems there, but um, it's doing good. The, the city put some sewer, or put some drainage up on the alley that helps a little bit, but um, I built the wall <laughs> to protect my garden as well from the water, but uh, yeah, it, um, I had three feet of, of uh, water in my basement in 2008. <laughs> I come home from a graduation party, Steve Leisterko's daughter, and I walked, I drove in the driveway and there was logs between my garage and, my, and me, and the water was going right down my back, oh it, my uh, which, was, which was good in a way. Liz, if Lizzie, my daughter, sees this, <laughs> she, she come home from college in 2008 just to tell a story. I always tell stories, don't I? Yeah, yes, um, you do. But, <laughs> That's uh, why you're fun. <laughs> and, but, uh, she had put all of her college stuff down in the basement. She just got home oh, from college. No. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Well, that made it easy then. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have, to, didn't have to move so much. They weren't in plastic tubs. No, take no, it. they were oh. floating all over the basement. Oh. That's mm. terrible. It, uh, yeah, but they put a sub pump into the basement now, and like I said, the, the house, I have documents that were um, 1842, okay. the house was built, or sold, sure. excuse me, a lot wow. sold, but uh, it was a pretty old house. The interesting thing about your property is that there is higher elevation hills on all three sides of it, so it's like you live the base of a big bowl, yeah. so I can I can totally see how that would fill up mm -hmm. during yeah. the 2008 flood and how that would be an ongoing challenge. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. but other challenges. That's about it, I think. And, uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about challenges and what kinds of gardens we have, and and. Uh, I think an interesting related topic to that is where do we all get our plants? And when I first moved here in 2006, I didn't know where I should really get my plants from. Mm -hmm. So I just went out to see, well, 
what's out there. And I learned some interesting things. And one of them is that those little, little bulb packages that the Piggly Wiggly sells, those are really good. <laughs> they're, they're a good value. And the, my first goal was, well, what, what's inexpensive that, that'll work? And that if it doesn't work, I'm not out that much money. So the, the, I like those little bulb packs, except for the columbines, they're too dry. Um, I also was pleasantly just pleased to find that Neitzel's, and now it's Howie's Hardware, uh, their plants, especially their perennial plants, are outstanding. Their supplier grows plants for this climate zone, and plants, perennials, I have bought from them, I, I've had have years later. My favorite example is a coneflower, and the variety is called hot papaya. Mm. That, that plant is over 10 years old, going strong, and it's slowly spreading, which I want it to do. My favorite part about that particular plant is that it starts blooming a few days before the 4th of July, and so it, it looks like yeah. fireworks. Oh. So, I, so I call that my, my 4th of July phase because I have other mm -hmm. plants that are white and blue in that little patch. So that's the fourth of, it's my patriotic oh. phase for that garden. Um, and then as I learned more about the, the area and what's around, I discovered that Jung's is a great place, Jung's in Sun Prairie, is where I like to buy my shade tolerant plants and uh, my clematis. Uh, but any greenhouse, there are a number of greenhouses around and you just just explore get it get online um, I love browsing through greenhouses and if I see an interesting looking plant I'll, I'll buy it <laughs> I'll make a little bed for it if it's but it has to be really interesting uh, other plants so I was mentioning that are clay tolerant are more your bulb kind of plants and rhizome plants and I tend to order those online in general so uh, Brex and Dutch gardens are good I like their uh, their irises and their bulbs, mm -hmm. especially. So otherwise, uh, I use uh, Jung's and Home Depot for vegetable seeds. And if I want an exotic vegetable, I'll try Blodgett's in Fort Atkinson. Mm -hmm. So that's oh, pretty much what I'm works there. for me. But I, I've, it's been a lot of trial and error to come up with my favorites. So how about you guys? You have, oh yeah, native plants. Best place for native plants is from somebody who's already growing them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah, seed. Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 I think I go to every single greenhouse within a hundred mile radius all the time. I just love to go to greenhouses to see what's there and see what I can find. And I, I'm always on the hunt for heirloom tomatoes. So, um, you know, I've been buying tomatoes from clients. You know, I just have different varieties I search out and mm -hmm. I, I go I go to everywhere. Um, I also grow a lot of pl my plants from seed as I mentioned. So I have um, you know, Johnny's, Park Seeds, Baker I think it's called Baker Creek. Is it Baker Creek? They have beautiful plants of really great colors and you know, like even the vegetables. So um, I, I try to find interesting varieties, and I have a lot of catalogs that have come oh, to yes. my house now because <laughs> I buy from everywhere, and I just am always looking for, for new, new sources of great seeds, unusual seeds, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I use many of those that have been mentioned. Um, for a lot of my bulbs, I'm always trying. Yeah, there's not a bad bulb on the planet. Um, John Sheepers is the retail catalog. Um, I use them a lot. Um, and then for perennials and such, a lot of my sources that I've used over the years, they've retired. How dare they? No. <laughs> um, or divisions from people, you know. Um, but I also, in Madison, I use K&A. Mm -hmm. They have good stuff. Um, and then um, it used to be called Winterland, and then McKay, they have the, McKay bought it. It's McKay Garden Center in Oregon. Oh. It's, and it's really, it's, it's you know, you, you don't have to be a contractor to walk in there. <laughs> and the, the perennials are awesome. So I go there a lot. Well, now I'm going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know about that. Word. It's fish hatchery <laughs> all the way to the... To, I think it's called Lincoln Road. It, you, it's the dead end. Sure. Yep. <laughs> so, 
yeah, it's a good place. Cool. I, I go to Young's as well in Sun Prairie. Mm -hmm. I also go to Deerfield Greenhouse. Okay. Oh, yeah. From oh, that's Deerfield. a good one for me. It, uh, but, uh, I've also Copeland in Oregon. Copeland Greenhouses. Hmm. It, oh. um, very, very good greenhouse and very large. Huge. Just love to walk through all the buildings and Copeland? Yeah, Copeland. How do you spell that? K O P. Thank you. I don't know. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> all right. It, uh, I'll find it. Copeland. It's okay. Like Copeland. It's, uh, oh, is it K O P P L I N? Yeah, it could be. I think maybe. Uh, okay. I don't remember now. Okay. It, uh, my friends from Deerfield are related to them. And that's how we got involved with them, and they okay. wonderful greenhouse over there. But uh, especially if you're looking for strawberries, I got strawberries at Deerfield, and but these strawberries at Copeland is wonderful. Mm, but, uh, okay. Yeah, it. Um, and I. I want to go back and talk about something, a problem <laughs> that I had, just to see if I could get some solutions. Okay. Mm. I take rainwater off the roofs. And I put it in a rain barrel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, and then I water out of the rain barrel. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, my wife, my wife orders seeds from everywhere, and she's a reference librarian, Jeannie, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, she she orders every, or get, finds everything, and 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 um, but we had, I was taking the water out of the barrel, and I and it. Come over to my house and anybody that I've taken into the gardens, I always ask them this question. I just had a roof put on my house and my garage. Okay. And the water comes across that new roof into the barrel. Has anybody ever had any problems? I had problems with my carrots this year, mm. oh. getting them to germinate because I was watering them out of the, out of the barrel. Mm. And it... Um, just if you're. Are you sure that was why? Maybe you had a I don't bad know. batch. Yeah. I don't know. It uh, it could be it could be that as well. You mm -hmm. know, but uh, my beets had the same problem. Oh. And my carrots had the same problem. Now my baby carrots, they went wonderful, and I was watering them out of that same barrel. And I don't know. Like you say, it could be yeah. just a bad batch, but. Um, yeah. I don't know. Our roof on our garage is fairly new. I don't know how new. And we just started with the rain barrel this year. Yeah. So I didn't notice any yeah. anything different yeah. this I'm year. Always, I've always used the rain barrel other years. But this year, of course, with the new roof, I thought, well, maybe there's some there might be some something runoff. coming off of that yeah. oil yeah. or something that's coming off that roof. <laughs> anybody knows of anything or problems like that, please mm -hmm. stop yeah. in and we'll take it down the garden and we can... <laughs> <laughs> what do you do about it? Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, can we uh, have a look? Right. Stop it. Um, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. so, I've noticed over the years that I, I got into a groove, more or less, with my gardening and my plants and, and uh, I decided to try something new and I was inspired to do that because of dealing with the War of the Trees that I mentioned earlier. So the War of the Trees resulted in damaged trees and basically over the 16 years we've lived there, we've lost half of our trees. Um, we lost four trees because they were ash trees. We lost some trees to disease. Uh, we lost some birch trees because they reached the end of their lifespan and were starting large chunks were falling off. So yeah. we had to cut them down. Uh, and we had two spruce trees that we just didn't like, um, and so remove those. Uh, I love being <clears throat> I love being barefoot, so it's not good to be barefoot around spruce trees <laughs> because they have these sharp little needles oh, okay. that that fall and, and poke. Anyway, um, but I, we both my husband and I felt bad about losing half of our trees, so I said, well, let's plant some new trees. And, and I've never done that before, never worked with trees or shrubs. Um, I didn't want another war of the trees, so I decided mm -hmm. to go for the, the dwarf varieties of trees. We wanted fruit trees, so, but we didn't want to be flooded with produce, so tried some dwarf fruit trees, and that's ongoing. Um, the first experiment was a dwarf cherry tree in our front yard, 
And it didn't do well for about five years until it finally managed to penetrate that lens of clay that we have. Mm -hmm. And then it really started doing well. That variety is called a Carmine Jewel. And it's to the point now, it's eight feet tall. It's all the taller it's going to get. And it makes cherries to the tune of about five pies worth a year, which is plenty for us. And the birds leave it alone because the cherries are really sour. Every year a sparrow will take one bite and then none of them touch the tree after that. <laughs> Makes great pies. So, uh, and then uh, with the flowering, I'm trying lilacs and Rose of Sharon. Um, with the trees, it takes longer to figure out whether you're doing something right or not, and it requires a lot more planning is to meet the exact site requirements for this particular tree. Mm -hmm. So that's the new thing I'm trying, and in the plant world, new is like, well, <laughs> for the last five years or so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not like the well, last week. So what new things, if any, are, are you guys trying out that is jumping out of your groove? Yeah, well, the, because I do like to grow a lot of tomatoes, and I don't have much space, as I have mentioned before. And the, the shade just keeps getting bigger. I, the last couple years, I've, I've been experimenting with trellising my tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So we put just a pole um, with four like coat hooks on each side, well, on, you know, a square pole with four coat hooks. And I can grow four tomatoes up a trail up a cord, up one cord mm -hmm. um, around that one pole. And I've been doing that for three years now and I'll never grow tomatoes any other way wow. after that. It's great. I can, I can fit a lot of tomatoes in one space. They're healthy. They're, they're of course, de deter indeterminate. Mm -hmm. You know, so they keep growing and you just have to keep pruning them. And it's a lot of fun, actually. It's kind of meditative you go out and you you know you keep wrapping it around and you keep pruning off those suckers and it's something you have to keep up with every day and i really enjoy it that's neat and i get a lot of great tomatoes yeah all sizes the small and the yeah large. i grow all sizes i grow because i like to grow so many different varieties mm -hmm. and colors i grow everything from a current tomato mm -hmm. up to you know a cherokee purple big mm. oh, big tomatoes so yeah full size yeah, works great. Okay, let's try that. And this way to maximize your sunlight. Oh yeah, since that's absolutely. A scarce resource. And all my space. Yep. Yep. Wow. Let's go up. You'd be amazed <laughs> at how many tomatoes you could fit. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 Are you doing any experiments lately? <laughs> <laughs> I have I have six uh, strawberry beds, and of course weeding is some of the problem for some people. Not necessarily me, but it, uh, but this year I took a, a weed, a weed fabric, and put across the bed, okay. and then I take cans, uh, cans, uh, coffee cans basically, and I put on there, and I burn holes in the fabric. Hmm. Uh, and okay, that, uh, that's great. And then that, uh, when I burn holes, and as I plant new plants, I burn more holes, and it keeps the weeds oh, down. Yeah, it keeps the weeds that's a great down. Great idea. And it, uh, then I put, I put um, one of my neighbors on the other side of Laura there. She had a lot of pine trees, and then I would take, I would come over to her place and rake up all, rake up her yard of pine trees, pine needles, and bring that back and put it into the strawberry beds and other beds too. Just. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's I've. I think I'm gonna keep doing it this way. I had I hadn't used weed fabric before. I mean, the rain goes through it. Everything goes through it. It's yeah. fine as far as watering, but it keeps the weeds down, and it controls controls the strawberries. Uh, a everbearing strawberry does not run as normal strawberries do. They won't take over the whole. Uh, they'll basically not run. So they're sort of hilled all the way around there. So that's good too. Yeah. And, that, um, and like I said, I started picking strawberries in June this year. And I picked my last strawberry on December 6th. Wow. Out of wow. the garden. Yeah. But I had to use plastic uh, mm -hmm. to protect them from the frost. But uh, yeah, it was quite a, quite a good year. <laughs> and, uh, but they're, 
this fabric that I'm using is good and I'm, I like that at tomatoes idea because mm -hmm. I have tomatoes and raised beds too and I, it, um, I'm going to try that. I got to have something. I, I get a lot of tomatoes. I mean, I get a lot of tomatoes, but to control them, like you say, it's, uh, that's kind of a neat idea. Can I ask him? It is. Got to ask you, you mentioned you burn holes in the landscape fabric using a coffee can. What's your source of, of fire? Of, or I just have a, a regular torch. Oh. You know, blow torch. Yeah, blow a torch. Blow torch. <laughs> I put it put it on there, and I just blow, burn a hole in it, and move it, and burn a hole in it. <laughs> it awesome. uh, has a pattern. And, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it, it cuts down on the weeding. I mean, you hardly have to weed it at all. But uh, yeah, it's it worked out real good, and I use that for tomatoes too. Do you ever have blight problem with tomatoes? Mm -mm. Occasionally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A blight problem occurs when the water that you're watering, the watering tomatoes bounces off the ground mm -hmm. and the bacteria comes up onto the tomatoes and starts mm -hmm. to blight. And I had problems with blight years ago, but I use a fabric now. Yeah. And I use cans. I plant the tomatoes in cans <laughs> so I can fill the can up with water. I don't have to bounce any water off of the ground and get the bacteria to sit or land on the tomatoes to start to blight. But, uh, and I haven't had any blight problems for a couple of years now because I use that fabric on those particular beds when I have tomatoes and things like that. So it uh, works out well, I think. I was going to ask you how you irrigate all those raised beds. Well. It's, um, I water them personally mm -hmm. with a watering can out of the, the tomato out of the rain barrel as much as I can. But I do have hoses as well okay. to water. But um, yeah, I'm trying to. I see I see online people water things, you know, with with little little tiny hoses. Little oh, irrigation. Drip yeah. irrigation. Drip mm -hmm. irrigation. Thank drip you. Yep. Drip yeah. irrigation which would be a neat idea for the tomatoes because mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have to mm -hmm. have any water bouncing off the ground and things like that. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I, the carrots, the carrots I take a, a fabric, a weed fabric, and I put the weed fabric on the ground. So I have five rows of, of tomatoes, or I mean of, of carrots, and then the weed fabric when I'm watering, the weed fabric will, will force the water, for the most part, to where I want it, which yeah. is on the carrots. Okay. <laughs> and, it, and, it keeps, and it keeps the weeds down. It just, I, just, I make little, little strips of them and put them in the raised beds, and I staple them on each end of the bed so they, they stay in line. So it, um, you know, yeah. it's kind of an idea that I mm -hmm. use for carrots. I use them for the onions. Um, and even for my wife's cut flower bed, I use the weed fabric, just little strips of it, and so I don't have to worry about weeding there. Mm -hmm. it, um, but I, and it forces water to where I want it. it um, yeah. And gently. Yeah, and gently. Which yeah. is nice. Right. It doesn't it, wash um, the seed away. Right. Yeah. It, um, but, yeah, the, um, on both sides of my raspberries, I have um, three layers of weed fabric. Both sides of my raspberries. I have weed fabric. Mm. So I put weed fabric down, three layers of them, which not only helps with weeds, obviously, but it also controls the, the running of the raspberries. Because mm -hmm. the raspberries will run yeah. forever. So they won't come around. Exactly. The, really, they that stay in the bed. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> they stay in the bed. I'm gonna try that. You know, <laughs> I had raspberries out at the farm, which mm -hmm. I couldn't put uh, weed fabric out there. But I like this idea. I just put the weed fabric on both sides, and it makes it nice for just walking and picking. And okay. It, um, but it keeps the raspberries in that three by fifty. It's three feet wide by fifty feet long. Mm -hmm. And it keeps them keeps the weeds down, and it keeps the raspberries in there. So, 
works out well. Yeah. But, yeah. Matt, have you experimented with anything new, new plants or new techniques oh, lately? I'm always trying new plants. Yeah, my my whole garden is kind of a test plot for to see is it as good as they think or as good as they say, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And it, I can't keep up, but um, yeah, um, these aren't necessarily new new, but um, Ito peonies are mm. lovely. They're a mix between the herbaceous and the tree peony, mm -hmm. so they don't flop. I always put cages around peonies, mm -hmm. um, but these itos, they're sturdy like a tree peony, but they die back to the ground. They're fascinating, and the blooms look like a more of a tree peony bloom than a regular, I mean all peonies, I love them, but, mm -hmm. but um, and the picture I sent you guys is a Bartzella, it's a yellow. Oh, really pretty. Um, there's, there are always new cultivars of everything. Um, Flocks, the coral colors are just lovely, I think. And the picture I sent you is called Lizzie. Um, it's been in my garden for years. And I don't even know if I can find that one anymore. Unfortunately, that happens in the gardening world. They, they, do, new, they do stuff, and it's great, and then they decide to move on, which mm -hmm. I hate it when they do that. <laughs> and then um, the last one I thought of was hellebores. Uh, Lenten rose, Christmas rose. It's a plant that a lot of people don't grow and should. Nothing eats it. They come up in March. Uh, they will seed. They're mm -hmm. seeding in my yard. Um, and the one I sent is just gorgeous, called peppermint ice. Ooh, yeah. Just gorgeous. I've admired that in the catalogs. Oh, yeah. it's as pretty as the catalog. It's as pretty as the catalog. That's yeah. saying something. Yeah. yeah. There, and I grow those as well, and they, they're also a very great vase flower, and they very mm -hmm. long-lasting. Yeah. And even out of water, you can make a, a crown. You know, I like to mm -hmm. sometimes do that. <laughs> and, and, yeah, that's one of those flowers that you can, you can do a lot with. Yeah. So I love that flower as well. Yeah. Really pretty. Um, something new I've also been experimenting with this year, it's been around for a while, I'm sure, but I just discovered it last year, and that was winter sowing. And where you, uh, because I, of course I love the greenhouse, but you, you get milk jugs or other plastic containers, and you plant things in them, and you put them out in the winter, and you leave the top open, and you just leave them, and then you you get some extra, lots of extra seedlings, and it works great. I'm gonna be doing it again. I'll probably be starting maybe next month. Huh. And it's especially good if you wanna grow perennials that need um, stratification, because they just get the stratification they need and then they grow, and I've had really great. I was really happy with it last year. Just perennials, so. or have you tried annuals? I do annuals and perennials, yes. Yeah, so I did poppies and I don't even remember what I all did, but I did. I, I just did a mix of perennials, and, and I had I had really great luck with the perennials that don't necessarily do as great in my greenhouse. They did really good in the with the winter sowing. So fascinating. Pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is neat. Yeah, the only challenge is finding all the milk jugs. I had a, somebody from work. Um, I asked her to bring me milk because we don't drink milk at home, so. Sure. Um, we don't have any, and she brought a whole bunch because she has a kid, and and <laughs> one day and left them on top of my car, and I took them all home. And nice, yeah. So, so what? How? What role do the milk jugs play in your winter sowing? So there, that's what you put. So you cut them in half, and and you leave it like a hinge. You know, so you can you don't cut it all the way in half. You cut okay. it open, put the dirt in. And then you plant your seeds, and you put it, and then you close it, and you tape it, label it, and you leave the lid off, and you just set it outside, and it's like a mini greenhouse. Is yeah. what oh, it you, is. So you close it back. I was wondering how they could survive. Yeah, yeah. you leave the top. Okay. You just leave the opening yeah. in the top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the cap back. On. Yeah, you just screw the tap. Yeah, and um, it, yeah, it, and then I started following the winter sewing group on Facebook, and you can learn a lot. 
the, you know, newbies and people that have been doing it for years and people sometimes people really, really get into it. And it, I just think it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Makes me want to try it. Well, I'll have to try it this year. <laughs> yeah. It right. definitely will extend your, your seed production if you like to grow unusual things or especially perennials mm -hmm. because they, they just do great. Yeah. Wow. You talked about your peonies falling down? Well, yeah, yeah, so I always put cages around them. Yeah. yeah. I put cages around ours my, in my wife's uh, perennial bed and peonies and stuff. But this year, in back of the garage, I had some old tires, bike tires. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So I took them, <laughs> took them over, put, them, put the peonies inside the tire. Oh, between the spokes. And then no, no. This oh. is just the just the just the oh, okay. rubber part. That would be neat too. I put yeah, that in there, and I put the peonies in there, and I put it up, and then I connected it to the. I, we have a wooden fence, so I connected to the wooden fence. Oh, uh, okay. So nice. So it keeps them. And, that they, works. and the the peonies covers the the tire, so you never really know it's even there, mm -hmm. but it, it kept them up. Very, very well. Oh, I bet, and it's you know soft and right. kind of gentle uh, with the. I put it on stems. top of that. I have the, the wire fence too, but I put this on top and pulled the peonies up and out of it and connected it to the fence, and it, <laughs> it worked very well. Because my wife would always complain, because oh, it's going to rain and my peonies are going to fall down. <laughs> <laughs> they look so sad. You got to go pick them up. Yeah. That's what you got <laughs> <laughs> for the bouquet. So I. With for keeping my peonies upright, what I do is I go out and um, cut willow, you know, cut willow twigs, or and then I like to make a little fence around the peony, and and sometimes you can just you know you take one end and stick it in the ground, and take the other end and just make a, a curve, and I do that with a lot of my plants, and it looks pretty too. Yeah. Nice idea. So, and it's fun. Next time I walk by your yard, I'll be looking for those <laughs> willows. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I've been experiencing differences in how my plants grow and the timing of it, what issues they face that I think are climate change related. And uh, I was born and raised in Wisconsin, and I remember as a child when it was typical to have a week straight of minus 20 in January. You know, that, that was mm -hmm. typically, we expected it. And now in the winter, if it goes below zero, everybody gets all excited and thinks it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that just doesn't, so it's warmer, the winters are warmer, mm -hmm. they're drier. And another thing I've noticed is that lately, the last several years now, we'll have this warm spring, this warm, very warm spring, and, and some of the plants buy into it, some yeah. of them don't. And then in May, early May, first week of May, a killing frost. So uh, I have coped with this part by, you know, my fruit trees and my, my flowering trees, we, we, <laughs> we all run out and wrap them in woolen blankets and bungee cord. Yeah. Um, I have bought bulk sheet plastic and make these these kludge little mini greenhouses to put over the tulips, which are going full blast in May. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that has helped. It's really annoying. Um, yeah, it is. And the other thing I've noticed is we'll have, and Wisconsin is, has a variable climate anyway. They always say, if you don't like the weather, just wait. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed we get more extreme over a period of a couple of days. And we can have, it's over 50. And then two, three days later, it's below freezing. And that kind of fluctuation, I, I think, is very hard on plants. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to cope with that, because it seems to be getting more intense the last couple of years. Um, I've tried using mulches for some of the plants. Um, unless I'm really, really excited about a particular plant, I tend to buy for a climate zone colder. Like we're in zone 4B and I will look for zone 3 plants, hardy to zone 3, to help the plants get through that extreme. But otherwise, it's, it's an ongoing issue and I think that we'll be dealing with it from here on out. Uh, have you guys noticed 
climate change effects in, in your gardens and what do you do, how do you deal with it? Um, definitely it, it feels like we're having drier winters and I'm always glad when it snows because I feel like it's my, my there, and there's not enough rain either in the summer. So I, you know, and I, I've been using soaker hoses and I'm, I'm actually thinking about buying an irrigation kit this year because it's really difficult to go all the way. I have so many gardens all around my house, it's difficult to bring the hoses all the way out there and I'm not good at putting away hoses, so. Uh, <laughs> you and me both. So having that would be definitely a time saver and I think a water saver too because I remember a couple years ago our water bill really went up because I was watering a lot because I just felt like things weren't getting enough water. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, um, the water, the water isn't, I think it's getting drier. Yeah. It, um, and like I said, I, I use plastic to cover my strawberries and things like that so I can have a longer season because it gets cold, but um, yeah, it, um, but they, they were very good, very good season this year, but I had to go out and cover them at night and go out and uncover them in the morning. It, um, if they can get the sun they need it, but uh, yeah, water bill is high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Late summer, early fall, I'm out there soaking things. And I just figure, you know, we spent so much time and money to create these yeah. gardens. I'm just gonna spend the money on the water to get them through the winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's worth it. Um, I have some irrigation, some drip here and there, but the bulk of my gardens, are, I just try to plant for drought tolerance as much as possible. Survival of the fittest kind of in my gardens. If something's not thriving, eh, that's okay. We'll mm -hmm. try something different. I don't like to baby the plants too much. So if someone, if, yeah. I, if I run across someone who's giving their perennials extra fertilizer or miracle grow, I haven't oh. <laughs> yeah. like, no, stop, stop doing that. <laughs> you want your perennials to get strong roots, trees, shrubs, all that, mm -hmm. um, I, you know. Fertilizer, in my opinion, is for annuals, mm -hmm. you know, because they're only going to live the season. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Fertilizer, when I had the farm, it was easy because I just bring cow manure from the farm. <laughs> but uh, now that I run out of the farm, well, then it's getting a little harder now. But it um, can get a garden mix from a local... McKay, you know, or there's a there's a place in DeForest. I can't remember if it's double D or double B. Circle B. I said thank you very much. Mm -hmm. God, she remembers everything I forget. Uh, <laughs> I, she's I use them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I use them too. Yeah. Um, they're very beautiful ground. Oh, just gorgeous. Just they're so fertile. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, organic matters by yeah. far the. You know, I use Osmocote um, in my like annual containers and such, but that's really the only fertilizer I use at all that's not organic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You talk about you were talking before about problems. Japanese beetles. Yeah. It, uh, I use neem oil. Does anybody use neem oil? It's an organic. I've heard of it. Yeah. I've tried it. Yeah. I've used the, the scent lure where it, it emits a pheromone that attracts them and then they go down into this container and die. Yeah. And I, it, I killed a lot of Japanese beetles, but the scent lure also You're drew a lot in. more in. Yeah. Right? So I was like, well, yeah. you know, this is really not yeah. the way my, to go yes. here. My wife will go out in the morning and take them off the beans and mm -hmm. take them yeah. off the raspberries and the tom, but. Yeah, it's the problem. Well, we hand pick them. I mean, we go out, we keep a, a jar of soapy water on the patio table and every day walk around and yeah. and I feel, and I've been also planting things that, not planting some of the things that they love. Like I used to have a grapevine 
-hmm. And I don't have that anymore, not because of them, but I just don't have it. And I know the flowers that they like the most mm -hmm. and um, other things they leave alone. And I feel like I've reduced them in my yard because we're just stay on top of not letting them reproduce <laughs> because they're, they're you know, you just pick them in. They're easy to catch at least. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you can just yeah. <laughs> throw them in that dish and, and then, you know, but that's how we've handled it. We've never used anything else. Yeah. I have a huge Virginia creeper. When we bought the house 20 years ago, it, it's, we built a little wall around it. It's so, I mean, they're so aggressive, but it was on the house, so it continues to live there. It's beautiful, yeah. but the Japanese beetles love it. Oh, yeah. Some years are worse than others. Um, and I just, I used to try to spray. Eh. They just, I just live with it. And then they go away and, and the, the plant rebounds and has beautiful fall color. I figure I can live with the Japanese beetles mm -hmm. for a couple months. And, I've kind of given up, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Do you ever spray the grass? No, I know the grubs, right? Yeah. Yeah. You should, you should spray the grass. With, with what? Neem oil? Seven. Or? Use seven. I mean, I don't like to use seven in the garden. Right. But the grass that's along the edge of the garden, because the Japanese beetles will be down. They'll live down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm during the winter and fall and winter and stuff. Yeah. So I've had pretty good luck treating the grass along the garden it, um, to keep the Japanese beetles down. But, yep. And, uh, and then, like I said, I use neem oil in the garden, but mm -hmm. it, um, it... I noticed in the last couple of years that there are far fewer Japanese beetles, and I think it's a plus for those May killing frosts, because the, mm -hmm. the grubs have a life cycle down under the ground, right. mm -hmm. and they start rising up to the surface when spring comes and the soil warms up because they're preparing to go through metamorphosis, and then you get a nice killing frost, and they're, they're right there, and then. Oh, well. <laughs> So that's I thought it was my picking them and not letting them reproduce. They really love my birch trees. I have one remaining birch tree in front of the house they and they just trees. savage it. Yeah. There were a couple oh. of years I really thought that tree was not gonna make it because it was just didn't have any leaves left. And they they love my grapevine and they love my hot papaya cone flower. And so I, I know what they like and I go yeah. pick them off. Yeah. Um, they, they don't. My dahlias and roses are the worst. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you noticed? Um, oh, ro uh, so this is a theory I've got too. If you have something they love, they might leave the other stuff mm -hmm. alone. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I've got that Virginia creeper, and next to it, I've got a hop vine. Well, they love both of those things. But around the corner, I've got this huge climbing rose. They're never on it. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Yeah, that's a good thought. I, I Come over know. here and eat this. Leave them yeah. Yeah. alone. Yeah. That's, that's a good I um, I read, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I read that they love geraniums. I don't know if that's true, but I did think about, you know, growing more, having more geraniums just to, so that they would have somewhere to go and they would leave everything else alone. I was thinking of that theory as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I've got a lot of geraniums and they don't touch them. Oh, but okay. that doesn't well, mean they wouldn't true. in your yard. <laughs> yeah, because they yeah. love the roses in my yard. Yeah, it's all different wherever. Yeah. You can be different from front yard to backyard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Last summer, I saw an English sparrow, another invasive species, eating a Japanese beetle deliberately. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so yeah. I'm hoping <laughs> that they'll take care yeah. of each other, so to speak, that the sparrows will mm -hmm. learn that, hey, this is a huge source of protein and there's no competition for this food source mm -hmm. and eat it. So, that, of course, that's years, but yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I enjoyed hearing what you guys were sharing about collecting rainwater um, with the drier summers and winters, too, and wanting to pr protect my investment in the gardens. He was watering, watering, of course, water bill. Yeah. And, and uh, it's time to start harvesting all that nice rainwater that comes water falling off our older home with the unusual pitched roofs mm -hmm. kind of thing and, and 
So it was my youngest son, actually, who, who went online and, and discovered a, a surplus sale for the Sauk City School District. <clears throat> and we, <laughs> we bought an old chlorine barrel from their swimming pool, 160 gallon, yeah. thick plastic, can leave it outside. <clears throat> and that is what we collect the rainwater coming off of our garage roof, which we had replaced that roof, but not the year that we put the rain barrel up. So I can't yeah. speak to that. And we've had no problems with that rain barrel, um, but we're, we're so happy with it. We put it up on some cement blocks, put a spigot in the bottom, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and uh, use a hose, but our lot is long and skinny, so where the rain barrel is at, if I want to use the rainwater everywhere, <laughs> you'll laugh when you see me. I <laughs> love these five gallon buckets of water and put them in the wheelbarrow and you know schlep it over to the place. <laughs> it and, works. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but and I, I'm tired of doing that, so I want another rain barrel over on the other end of the property, and mm -hmm. I want to harvest this immense waterfall that comes off the south side of our roof. Sure. So. Again, go on online and see what existing containers can be repurposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it turns out that there are food grade uh, cubes, plastic cubes, that are inside a welded metal frame yeah. that'll hold 240 gallons each. Mm -hmm. And they <clears throat> are used by, say, vegetable oil plants to store vegetable oil in, mm -hmm. or uh, soda syrup. And we, we found a fellow outside of Watertown who was selling them, and mm -hmm. we paid $60 each for, for two. Yeah. And that's what we're going to use to try to uh, harvest that immense waterfall that comes off the top of our roof. So we'll see. Wish me luck on that. We'll yes. try to get that going this summer. <laughs> yeah. And that I will be able to use a hose and get all the tree lawn plantings. Yeah. And that'll cut down on the wheelbarrow schlepping of the five-gallon buckets. And of course, they splash. And, so um, I don't know if you guys have any other, you know, more plans for harvesting your rainwater or is that, have you pretty much topped out? It sounds like you've got yours all figured out with your ingenious channeling well, that you I've, do in your backyard. Uh, I've got one rain barrel. We, we have a raised deck and so we have a gutter above that. And so we just detour it down under the deck to the rain barrel. I could use another for sure. And then the overflow just goes right into the garden because I don't always get to it. But um, I got our barrel from a uh, car wash, the, mm. what they sell the soap in, like 50 mm -hmm. drums, and it's either white or black and they're thick. So mm -hmm. it's outside right now tipped over with a spigot. So I just fill the buckets. I mainly use mine for the, my annual containers for oh. extra. Mm -hmm. Because um, I've got my gardens are too big to to use the rain barrel. I, at one point, I thought, is there some way I could use gravity <laughs> mm -hmm. and link it to some sort of emitters? Mm -hmm. But uh, that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I am gonna get another one for the other side of my house. I've, I have, the one we have is on our garage. I want to get enough, at least one more, maybe two. Mm -hmm. Just. Partly because it, there's one area of my yard that it's really hard to get a hose to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to, you would have to add, keep adding on to, to the hose, and it would be really long and then really hard to put away. <laughs> so, it's much easier just, I think, to get the rain barrel and and hook that up. And I think it's better than than municipal water for plants anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. It doesn't have the chlorine it. and, and mm -hmm. whatever else. Special. Yep, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I was talking with uh, with someone recently who said that rainwater is better for your house plants too. And, yeah. and uh, I don't have good luck with house plants. I have, they're better off outside if they're in my care. But mm -hmm. so I've been trying this winter to, so that means I have to keep some buckets of my rainwater in the garage so they don't freeze solid, mm -hmm. so I can <laughs> use it through the winter. But I can see the sense in that because the. Uh, the city water chlorine and such eventually builds up in your pots, and then it becomes toxic to the plants. So, okay. so we'll we'll see how that works. Um, but it's 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 ongoing, and when we with the more extreme weather events, due to global climate change, the storms are more intense. 
So when you're collecting your rainwater, you're going to get these deluges that last for like two days. And well, that's yeah. your rain for this month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's true. You can spread it out then. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, like I mentioned, my sidewalk friends and, and people wanting to talk with me about whatever it is I'm doing when I'm working in my yard. I, I've noticed a couple of things, and one of those things I've noticed is a lot of people in my neighborhood come from uh, agricultural background. They either grew up on a farm or their close relatives have farms and they've spent a lot of times on farms. Um, I was raised in a rural area and all our neighbors were farmers, so I spent a lot of time on farms myself. Uh, my parents come from farming families. I thought that was an interesting theme for Waterloo, and I, mm -hmm. I suspect a lot of residents are come from an, an agricultural background. Uh, but then there are the ones that don't, and there are the ones who, who will ask me for, for tips. And the common I get, question I get asked most commonly is, how can I have plants like yours without doing all the work? <laughs> Dream on. Yeah. And, and I can understand, you know, uh, uh, I have young children, and we both work, and, and I, I don't have the time to do all of this. And, and there are some, some tips, and, and uh, one I like to share is plan. Decide what you want to plant, but also learn about what your, what your property is like. Plan. And you will save yourself so much time and so much money if you plan carefully. And the biggest thing in the planning is what's your soil like? And, and what are you going to do about it? And if you don't want to do anything about it, then plant something that, that can thrive in that kind of soil. And the, the other advice I give is if you don't want to do a lot of work, invest in perennial plants mm -hmm. because you just plant it in the right spot, give it minimum care, and, and you always have it, you know, unless something bad happens. Um, and then the, the other, how can I get what you have with no work <laughs> tip is, is go with your native plants, like your, your black-eyed Susans and, and your, your coneflowers and your prairie blazing star, because they, they evolved for here, so they don't need all the extra work and effort. And you're always going to have to do some weeding. There's no way around it. Um, the last tip I give people who are asking for it is if you, if you always want to have something blooming, do the layers. Mm -hmm. You know, get bulbs and plant them in layers, and the bulbs that bloom later tend to need to be planted more deeply. So you naturally have all these layers. And that's, that's work when you first set it up, but then it's done. Yeah. So have, have you guys get, did you guys get asked for tips and how do I, well, I do really, this or that? No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't, I can't think of anything I've been asked about. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Other than what is that? <laughs> well, you've been given lots yeah. of tips on this show. So. <laughs> yeah. they, they, taught, they, they asked me about the raised beds. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I were to do the raised beds again, okay, and like I said, I have 30 raised beds, and if I was to do them again, instead of making them 10 inches high, I would make them two feet high. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put wood and, you know, compost, you know, I have, I have two compost areas, I develop compost, and you can put them in there and then put the dirt on top. But um, see, seeing that I'm over 70 years old, why, it makes it easier to, <laughs> than having to bend down all the time. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, I would make the raised beds higher. And, my, and I told my sister in Lake Mills, she has raised beds now too. And then they, they have a two by four on the edge of it so you can sit there. Yes. And it's very comfortable, mm -hmm. it's very yep. good, it uh, saves saves your back, <laughs> yeah. it, uh, but, uh, oh yeah. I have one raised bed because I have a lot of shade. Sure. <laughs> and lots of big trees like you guys. Um, and the raised beds are, they kind of, is one's taller and then it diminishes down. It's kind of a big one. But we uh, clad it with old pallets. Hmm. We didn't want to, we did the frame out of good wood. And then, um, you know, and we did the shelf 
so I could sit on it. I wanted to be able to do that or stand. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the case maybe. Um, tip would be um, for somebody who wants low maintenance, you know, the weeds not to get out of control, mulch early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mulch with good mulch. Yeah. That would be my number one tip. A double shredded hardwood mulch um, after fear of frost would be my recommendation. And you know, you get that mulch on there, you're still going to get weeds, but you're not going to get a field of weeds. And when it rains, it'll keep the ground moister longer. Yeah. There's a lot of benefit. And the double shredded, I recommend because it breaks down. You want it to break down to add to the soil mm -hmm. instead of the stuff that doesn't break down. Right. Yeah. So the natural stuff. That's why I like to use leaves. Leaves are fantastic. Yeah. 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 Hard to find that source anymore. If you need, yeah. if you need the acid, then you can use uh, the uh, pine needles, of course, and yep. stuff like mm -hmm. that. But, uh, pine needles, yeah. It, Great. Uh, what else is I going to say? <laughs> See? I lost it. <laughs> There's so much to talk about, isn't there? I lost it. Yes. Does anybody have any other topics to share in today's episode? Or anything else you want to share with you about any garden topic? Or did we pretty much go through it all? I, think. I just thought of it. I knew you would. <laughs> Your fence. My fence. Oh, oh, yes. yes. I would. If you wanted to see a nice fence, <laughs> go over and see her fence. I, I had trouble with rabbits. I had trouble with woodchucks even, mm. you know. And I, I built the fence around my garden, all the way around with a gate on it. And, uh, and I got rid of everything, but uh, that fence that you have, that's brilliant. It's Menards. Yeah. It, uh, you it, told uh, me it, it's, uh, it's metal with a nice coating, so it weathers well. I, right. I tried all different kind of fences. He's talking about my vegetable garden fence. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but it, uh, the space between the, it's, it's basically metal rods yeah. with, uh, with horizontal bands of metal to hold it all up. And it's, uh, it's like it's, a hardware cloth? Is that what, not a chicken wire, but something more these substantial? Are metal, it's, metal yeah, rods. They're about an eighth, eighth of an inch thick, a little, yeah. maybe three sixteenths of an inch thick. Okay. And they're coated with a black, kind of black all-weather paint. Yeah. Oh. And they don't, so they don't rust. And they look, and they look nice, too. I can leave it, it up. Nice. Oh, neat. Yeah. Put it in and leave it up, and it, it, there are two gates in it. It's a kit that you buy. And, I bought the shorter version. There's also the kind that will keep deer out that's over six feet tall. Um, you don't need that one. Don't need that one. <laughs> the deer don't come that far into my neighborhood. They, that's good. They, they, they're over on the K way, but they, they don't come over to Knowlton. I think You'd there's just. You'd be surprised. I think there's just I have, too much. I have, I have pictures on my phone that are very close to your house. Oh, the, the, the McKay way changed the route of the deer. Uh -huh. So they, I have them right up, the, right up the street from me, walking down the road. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, right I had no road. idea. Yeah. I, I thought they stopped because, because they're all those farmers' fields, and there's yeah. McKay yeah. over on our corner area of Waterloo. So I thought that they preferred that and wouldn't come into the, into the presidents. I had a deer run mm -hmm. across in the back of my garden. <laughs> wow. Casey's. <laughs> Casey's yard. Okay. The dog was pretty fired up about that. I bet. <laughs> but, uh, but they don't. They don't eat much of course. But, uh, well, maybe that's it. I, but I've never seen their tracks. Yeah. I have not seen their calling cards. Um, have not seen any browse marks where we're at. So maybe that will change. Yeah. Now, that'll be another fun challenge to figure out, huh? Mm. How to deal with a deer. The worst problem I had was with groundhogs, but I just got that critter ritter and sprinkled a perimeter around the vegetable garden, and that was before I got we got that new fence. But, okay. I had a little grub, or gophers, mm -hmm. gopher problems. Here's a little hint. Okay, 
if you use a little gopher traps, okay, which I did, and I got gophers the first day out of my garden, and then they're beside my house, and I got a gopher there, but um, there's a neighborhood cat. Yeah. So he, he took my gopher and my trap. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I like him because he, he goes down to the sewer. He, he lives right in front of my house, right down the sewer there. Oh, so he's one of the feral cats. Yeah, he yeah. just runs around. And, and then, I, then I tied the traps down in the garden. And then, then of course, he, he would eat, eat what he could off of the yeah. trap. <laughs> but, uh, so if you do use the traps, Tie them down. Tie them down. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to lose. The roaming cats will swipe them. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that about wraps this episode up. I want to thank you very much for joining us today for our first episode of Waterloo Gardens. And uh, please, if you are passionate about gardening or have a friend who is passionate about gardening and you would like to become part of our gardening series, let us know. You can contact our station manager at WLOOCATV at gmail.com. And we'd love to have you on the show. It's by people who love gardening for people who are interested in gardening or already love it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>